Jesus told them a story. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your lifetime, you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner, evil things. Now he is comforted here. You are in agony. Besides all of this, between you and us is a great chasm that has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. And no no one can pass from there to us. He said, then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he might warn them, so that they will also not come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In a suburb of Mexico City, an orphanage recently hosted a group of American students who had traveled there for a mission trip. It was a church group that came. And they were there because they knew this was a large organization that gave shelter to children whose parents were largely victims of the ongoing violence they have across their nation. So this group went there and they repainted three of the main hallways. They helped move a huge pile of rocks from one side of the backyard to another so that another project might get started. And they brought a large donation from their church to assist the orphanage. It was a picture-perfect mission trip, it would seem. Researcher Robert Lupton, the author of the book Toxic Charity, interviewed the director of the orphanage, who pulled back the curtain a little bit. We need lots of things to make this orphanage run, he said, but unfortunately, teenage volunteers are not one of them. Yes, groups come, and they insist that they bring young people, so we give them work to do. So here's the thing. There wasn't just one group that visited the orphanage to paint walls and move rocks. There were close to a dozen. It turned out that same hallway got painted every other week or so, a different color by a different group that came. And those rocks that were in the backyard, they went from one side of the yard to the other and back and forth week by week as different groups arrived. The director said, the church sends us these groups. No one asks us what we actually need. Those donations, those keep our doors open. We need those. But groups come and they never return. I trust their hearts are in the right place, he says, but it seems like they might care more about making themselves feel good about the work they're doing than the actual work that is needed for this orphanage. He said, I wish they would only ask us. If you've been here the last couple of Sundays, you know that our scriptures have shared the common theme of stewardship. 
That is our, our use of money and how faith calls us to interact with it. And that's no coincidence. We've been making our way through the Gospel of Luke in the lectionary, and Luke, more than any other New Testament writer, talks extensively about money. Today's passage is a vivid example in which we see a poor man named Lazarus raised up into heaven and an unnamed rich man tormented in Hades. Now, there are scriptures that paint with rather broad strokes when it comes to talking about money, and sometimes those are understood to say that wealth is inherently immoral and that those who do not have wealth are inherently virtuous. What comes to mind, of course, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter heaven. But there are clues in this passage that point us toward a deeper meaning, I think, for what Jesus is saying. And it isn't that we might have money, but rather how and why we use it. We know very little about the rich man of this parable. We know that he is wealthy. We're told that. We know that he feasts sumptuously. And by the fact that he wears purple clothing, we know that he is either of a senatorial family in the Roman Empire, or if he's wearing all purple, that he is an extended family member of the emperor himself. So this isn't just someone who has some money. This is an incredibly, incredibly wealthy individual. You see, in the Roman Empire, in the time of Jesus, just 3% of citizens controlled something like 95% of the empire's wealth. There was a very clearly defined ruling elite class. There was a small middle class, shopkeepers and bankers, religious officials. The vast majority of people were peasants, people who worked fields and lived subsistence farming lives. And then there were the outcasts, those who by illness or some other social condition found themselves outside of society entirely, untouchable. They were incredibly poor. They were usually forced to beg for survival. We hear a lot about those people from Jesus and lots of his other teachings. And we meet then Lazarus, who by all accounts is not the same Lazarus who was raised from the dead in the Gospel of John. This is a different Lazarus, and he certainly seems to fall into this lowest category of untouchable. So if we want to understand why it is that these two polar opposite people find themselves together in this story, there are two other details that are important to know. One is that in the Roman Empire, these uber-wealthy elites, the 3%, almost all played the role of patron in their society. In other words, because they had so much wealth, they were expected to serve as something of a financial resource to the people in their community who were beneath them. There were no such things at that time as large banks. They obviously didn't have credit cards. And these wealthy individuals, they had lots of cash on hand and were able to afford guards to, to watch what they had. And so to begin each day, patrons would receive guests, sometimes hundreds of them, who they would give out um, pocket change to, to, to the poorest, or give out loans to middle and upper class members of society. This was how a lot of the daily cash flow in a region was guaranteed. The patron benefited because for what amounted to a rounding error of their overall wealth, they gained the loyalty of hundreds of people in their community, which either gave them prestige or loyalty if there happened to be an election that was coming around sometime soon. But these patrons funded public works projects. They were the ones who paid for roads. They paid for statues. They were the ones who funded a lot of the sporting events that happened in these communities. In other words, it is almost guaranteed that by virtue of his station, this man would have given generously. 
he would have given away much of his money, and Jesus' followers probably would have known that as he was telling this story. So this parable is not so much a critique of an individual moment where a wealthy person decides whether or not to help a beggar. This is a parable that teaches us about why and how we should be generous. And the lesson comes from the second detail of the story, that across all four Gospels, Lazarus is the only person in a parable that Jesus tells who is given a name. Names are important. Names are important to God. God actually has many names, Adonai and Elohim and Yahweh, to name just a few of the many. And God also is in the business of using names symbolically. Abram becomes Abraham. Jacob becomes Israel. Sarai becomes Sarah. Or just ask any couple who's expecting a baby, And they will confirm that what you call somebody means a lot. And compromises and changing of minds can sometimes be a source of conflict. Not that I have any personal experience (laughs) sitting in a coffee shop with my 38-week pregnant wife going over for the thousandth time that, yes, we have chosen a great name for our soon-to-be arriving daughter. In this case... Lazarus having a name serves as a giant blinking neon sign that tells us, pay attention to this guy. And in fact, we learn that the rich man knows Lazarus' name already. Though he seemingly ignores Lazarus as he sits at his gate, once he is down being tormented, he looks up at Abraham and asks, what is Lazarus doing up there? He knew Lazarus' name. If I understand the text, I think we are meant to learn that God calls us to relationship with those we give to. And when we give, we must do so selflessly and not for self-gain. The rich man very likely did give generously, but he did not do so for the sake of others. He did so for his own prestige. And you'll notice, too, that even after his time on earth is done, his only concern is for his brothers, his family. He had no interest in helping any others with the lesson that he had learned. I understand the definition of godly love to be the elevation of others' well-being equal to or ahead of our own. And that is what the rich man fails to do. But by naming Lazarus, Jesus tells us also that we must be in proximity to those who are in need, that there's no real way that we can serve other people selflessly and lovingly if we do not first know their stories, get to know them, know their name. I think the partnership that this church has with the saints in Voy, Kenya, is a wonderful example of this. As one person put it in Bible study this week, this partnership seeks to live beside and not give mindlessly to a community that is very much in need. What St. Barnabas does donate is born from decades-long friendships that are continued in visits there and here. Friendships with leaders of the school and the orphanage that we are connected to in Voy. It respects their dignity. It considers them equal partners in the relationship. It is generous, and it is selfless. I think it's a terrific example. I hope we as a community at St. Barnabas can display that same sort of orientation towards each other within our community, and especially display that in our outreach. You might have seen on your way inside in our outreach fair all the different areas of this congregation's mission that seek to live that out. I think especially about our new relationship with the Boys and Girls Club of Richardson, who now shares a physical space with us. I hope we can build a similarly faithful relationship, one where we know them well, and know them by name, and are generous towards them, and that that can continue to build. I also hope we can discern ways to love those who literally sit 
at our gate, those who we can see from the seats that we are in right now. Richardson High School, the RISD Clothes Closet, the Newcomer Center. I pray that we can build relationships with them faithfully. Because like the rich man, we as a congregation have resources at our disposal. And while there will be stewardship sermons coming soon that might wrestle with how we are each called to live generously with our individual resources, our passages from Luke and 1 Timothy tell us also that our generosity and how we practice generosity together as a congregation matters a lot to God. May the Spirit guide us and love define us as we walk along that path. Amen.